Welcome everyone, this is the latest episode of the Odyssey podcast, my name is Jeremy Mullally, I'm your host and um, today I have a very special guest um, who I have no trouble saying is um, a very uh, important and innovative person in the um, IT and tech space, um, it's um, Doug Childress from uh, Clarity and um, he's joining us today, he's gonna, we're, we are going to dive a bit into that um, conversation of IT and tech and also about um, his career in business. So uh, I want to welcome you to the show, Doug. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, likewise. And um, look, uh, before we sort of get into our um, conversation, for those of our listeners who may not have heard of you or, or Clarity for that matter, um, could you just tell us a bit about you know who you are and what Clarity is? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Clarity Limited. I uh, started the company in 2015 conceptually. And I wanted to build the first technology platform that could be sold like a utility. So similar to electricity, water, and gas. We don't really uh, consider how it's delivered. We just want to consume a product. Technology's been very complicated for many, many years. It's been very fragmented and delivered by multiple vendors. So what I wanted to do is to build a offering from one vendor that brings everything technology together and sell it as a service. We started that in 2017, and quite pleased to say that uh, 30 June this year, we cracked the 3 million revenue mark. Uh, We're acquiring businesses, growing nationally, and uh, it's been quite successful. Yeah, that's very exciting, Doug. And and like I sort of mentioned in the you know preamble, you are I do see you as an innovator in that space based on the way you've you've structured things. But your introduction into that space wasn't with Clarity, it was before that, right? So I'd love to hear how you did get into that space of tech and and IT. Where where did that start for you? Yeah, look, it goes way back. So age 24, I started my first computer company. Uh, I left a six-figure job in the U.S. because I believed that PCs were going to be a thing of the future. Uh, PCs hadn't been invented at that time. Microsoft Windows wasn't even around. Uh, The Internet was not even thought of. And um, I saw that, you know, this personal computing thing could be a big thing. So I started my first company, age 24, ran that for 14 years, kind of burned myself out. Um, Learned a lot of lessons along the way. Uh, Ended up, that company failed. And it failed for a good reason. And I'll go into that in a little bit when we talk about some other things. Yeah. But I really found that that was the niche. That's what really made me tick, was coming up with technology solutions to solve problems. Uh, 2001, came to Australia, four hours before the September 11 bombing. That was my first day in Perth. Um, Came here because I met a girl and wanted a sea change. And man, did I find a sea change. (laughs) Uh, 2005, I created my first company in Australia, first technology company, uh, became a licensed carrier, never done that before, but I thought, well, let's make it happen. We were the first licensed carrier in Australia to deliver a managed solution all the way to the telephone. Um, so I had a great career there, uh, kind of in that next business, but I've just found that where my niche is, is I'm an inventor, entrepreneurial person that's born with a kind of a spirit to lead and a passion for technology. Fantastic. And and look, let's. there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about, but yeah. I, I, would, I do want to start at that beginning point because a lot of people who have, um, you know, been previous guests on this show and a lot of the people that listen to this show um, do have that entrepreneurial drive, of course, but especially from a younger age. So like you said, it was the age of 24 when you made that step. Um, I sort of want to dive into, uh, I guess, where you were in that, that, that kind of headspace, you know, like making that jump. And, and like you said, it, it was it was a time when it, there wasn't that certainty of what, you know, the future of PCs or the internet would be like. Um, I just want to get an idea of like where you, what, where did you get the courage for, to do that, that yeah. make that kind of leap? That's a great question because I had a small family at mm. the time. My daughter was about uh, one and a half years old. I had a company car and was in a really good paying technology job. Um, And I thought, why would I do this? Uh, I spoke to my dad and he said, son, you're leaning over the edge of a mountain. Either grab my hand and I'll pull you back or leap off the edge and 
you know, take a leap of faith. Mm. Uh, it was a scary thing that I did, but I thought I know how to deal with the technology side of it. But what I found was a very tough lesson. I had no clue about how to actually run a business, what a balance sheet was, how hard it was going to be to find capital and a lot of those other elements. And uh, it was a real struggle outside of the technology side of things. Uh, and that's the reason I think that business failed in the end because the business got so big and I'd missed the fundamental parts of running a business, not the technical aspect. Okay, so that's interesting. So in a sense, your business was growing in a way, but it was growing out of your control. So that even though um, you may have been you know, had to uh, turn over or whatever or, or size of the company, there were you do feel like there was missing like a foundational uh, element to to the business. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. What I guess my if I look back and reflect on it, I was the chief cook and bottle washer. And the problem was, is I needed people around me. I had people around me, but they were following my instructions. I didn't have the right people in the organization that could actually take responsibility for the areas of business. So I became the bottleneck. And what I didn't focus on was the cash requirement, because all of a sudden here comes this thing called the internet. And people wanted to connect to it. And back in those days, we had like these 56K modems right and people were ordering these left right and center because they wanted to figure out what this internet thing was all about so my business went exponentially through the roof and then i realized wow there's a lot of capital investment required there's a lot more people required etc and i didn't have that fundamental dollar backing to get me over those to actually jump the hurdles that were in front of me yeah okay i just want to dive into that part about what you said about the, having the right people around you and building that team because you have a very solid team now with clarity. Yeah. When you, um, in that you know first iteration of, of your business journey, um, did you understand that at the time was only in retrospect now that you do have such a good team that you're able to say, oh, you know, that's where the problems were. You know, like I didn't have you know, the, either the right people, I didn't have the right relationships with people. Is yeah. It, yeah. So I'll tell you when that became evident was yeah. when I was in bankruptcy court and I was looking, and probably wasn't even then because that was the shock factor. Mm. We failed, now what do we do? It was probably the leading months after that when you sit back and you think you're completely deflated. It's like someone has popped the most core balloon you've ever had. And to sit back and then try to analyze why it happened and that's probably when I started to realize it. So it was definitely in retrospect um, that I discovered that if I ever was going to do this again, that I'd m make sure that I had the right people around me. So my tech company number two, back in 2005, that was one of my core focuses. Was the team. Was the team. Yeah, okay. Well, let's let's explore that then. What what are the factors you look for um, when you're building a team, like for yourself, and, and what would you recommend for others? What kind of things do you, do you look for to get the right people? Above and beyond probably their technical skill set or their academics or whatever their capabilities are, yep. I'm looking for the person with the right character. So the right character, the right drive. Um, we know that we can teach and train people to do a certain thing within an organization as long as they've got the basic building blocks. But what we need is to make sure that their ethos and their character actually fits the organizational culture. Mm, okay, because you mentioned before that, uh, you, that when you had the wrong people, so to speak, it was a case of they were following you. When you say that, do you mean they were following you blindly without like thinking about what they were doing or was it a case of that were um i guess uh, not not um trying to you know innovate and try to uh, think outside the box so to speak yeah i think a lot of it was they were they think they could do their jobs but everything filtered through me every decision if a client rang, if there was a decision to be made, it came through me. And that was not their fault. That was me thinking that I was the be-all, end-all. But what I realized is when the business actually failed, 
Uh, and I looked back, I, th I thought, you know, where was the problem? And the problem was in the way that I actually uh, okay. ran the business. Yeah. So I thought, if I ever do this again, there's got to be a change. Okay. And is that, do you, do you see that coming down to trust then, like trusting in the people that you do have around you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that I've got technicians that have worked for me now since 2006, so 15 years on. Um, I've completely entrust their area of responsibility to them, and I expect that there's a trust relationship in everything that we talk about. It's a two-way street. So I've given them the trust factor from me. Now I expect them to earn the trust factor back. Yeah, no, that seems fair enough. And and so going into, um, yeah, as you put it, you know, IT company number two, yeah. um, given that you did... Um, uh, so like you, you sort of had that I guess failure from the first one yeah how did you again like how did you find the courage to go and you know start up a new venture you know I know some people would be very deflated and yeah and um, you know going through that process how did you you know get the chance to pick up the pieces so to speak well I guess the when I failed in the first company and I don't mind admitting that because I think most entrepreneurs that are going to go down this track you need to expect you're going to fail. You're going to fail, and if you don't fail, you'll be damn lucky. And in that failure, what I discovered was I needed a break. I had burnt myself out. I came to Australia, as I said, to meet yep. someone. I decided that I'm just going to give up my whole dream of being an entrepreneur, and I'm just going to work for someone else. And what I found was is I couldn't bury that entrepreneurial spirit. It was like a yeah, worm trying to get back mm. to the surface. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually went to my CEO and I said, I've got a vision that I think voice over IP is going to become the next big thing. Now, this is back in 2005. I gave them my business plan and about 10 days later, they said it's three to five years ahead of itself. I said, can I have my business plan back? They said, sure thing. And I gave them a letter of resignation. Didn't have a job. I quit again. Within four weeks, I had investors behind me. We started that company, and eight years later, we sold it for $20 million. Fantastic. That's you know an excellent feat, like you said. It, and so do you see that you do need to overcome those, uh, I guess, failures and, and challenges so that you do, you know, th th there's always a positive at the end of that, that tunnel. It is. And I think what you've got to do is be willing to accept looking at yourself, taking a hard look, take a hard look because, you know, you're as much the leader as you are the obstacle. And I think that, um, you know, what really drove me to doing the second tech company was the fact that I believed in the vision to the point that I was willing to sacrifice yet another job to prove a point. And on that, I actually went to the investors and I said, I am so confident I can do this. I won't take a salary for the first year. Well, and did that, I guess, give them a lot more confidence in it what did. you're saying? Yeah, it yeah. did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and while we're in that era, because uh, uh, one of the things I definitely wanted to ask you about was um, making that move from the States and coming to Australia, because there's, there's a lot of people, I mean, Australia is kind of that, you know, uh, melting point, uh, uh, you know what I'm sorry to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, of having people who are, you know, from all sorts of different countries around the world um, who are, you know, working here, they start businesses and, and so on. Um, could you... Describe your journey of doing that, even though you didn't move over to start a business, but you, you did eventually do that, you know, a couple of years later. Yeah. Tell me what that journey was like for you. Look, it was really tough. Um, my first business through the whole failure side of things, we I went through a divorce, I ended up uh, leaving the country, meeting someone over here. But the toughest challenge was actually leaving my two children and my family behind. Mm. Um, I had a belief that I'd be able to come back, you know, every few months and visit or at least once a year and get my kids to come across. That become a tougher challenge than what I thought, just because of cost and all the things involved. Um, so probably that would have been the hardest thing that I had to deal with. But the 
The other thing that was really tough was for the first two years in Australia, I came from a culture where it was both people working as hard as you can possibly work, a pace of life that's like 10 times faster than what it is here in Australia. Now, all of a sudden, I've gone from this hectic lifestyle to a very relaxed environment, which I love. I've uh, been here almost 21 years now. I love this place. Um, but it was a real challenge to try to change that culture shift from one, the U.S., to here in Australia. Um, and I'd say it probably took me a first, at least the first two years to really let myself slow down, let myself open up to embrace a new culture. Yeah, okay. And did you see um, that particularly in the business environment as well when you were in that in that space the the differences in the in the culture absolutely absolutely i have to tell you just quickly a funny story yeah, so please. my first day starting with a not my company but a company in the tech space here in perth yep. uh, my first day was melbourne cup working for them and then you know at 10 30 in the morning they're like okay we're going to lunch and i didn't come back to work that day <laughs> And the following, that same Friday, so that's a Tuesday, that Friday we went to lunch at 1130 and didn't go back to work that day. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is the life. I've never seen something like this because in the U.S. I was working 16 hours days. All right, it's okay. So no wonder you were burned out. <laughs> I was burned yeah, out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, do you see any other, um, you know, differences and maybe even similarities between the, you know, the business culture um, from where you working in the States versus here in, in Perth? Yeah, in the States, one of the biggest things is uh, annual leave. Everybody knows that. Uh, you know, you could work 15 years before you get three weeks off paid annual leave. But the other thing is in the in the U.S., it is so competitive environment. Um, there's none of the fair work that we have here in Australia. Um, so you literally, if your manager didn't like you in the U.S., they would just ask you to leave. They might pay you three, four days, or maybe a week, could be two weeks severance pay, and off you go. Uh, here in Australia, you know, we've got the fair work, and it's a lot more structured in the way that we deal with things like that. Um, so I like the fairness of what we get here in Australia. Uh, in the U.S., it's brutal. It's kind of like a disposable employee mindset mm. from the employer which i find very you know it's just um it's very sad you know if you think about there's just no commitment from the employer back to the employee you're more of a liability than you are an asset yeah okay and and one thing i was curious about doug um more so when you um started up your, your new company around 2005 was i guess I mean, just from my point of view, because I see a, a huge value in the in the network that you have um, in, in a business environment. Was that a difficulty that you had, given that you were only in the country for about you know four years? That you, you know, do you feel like you had that network around you? And if not, did you find any impact on the way you were, um, you know, starting to operate? Yeah, look, I think that what I did in that four years was I set my mind to when I came to Australia. I'm going to find a job and I'm going to learn the ropes. I'm going to find out who I need to know and I'm going to build the relationships that I need because I knew deep down inside of me I'd do it again. Yeah, it wasn't over. It wasn't yeah. over. I had a story mm -hmm. that I needed to keep writing. Mm -hmm. um, so in that four years that I was trying to kind of rebuild my courage, uh, I was also making very key relationships. But more than that, I was trying to prove to everybody here in Australia that I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, just a, a quick example, when I joined my first tech company here in Perth, uh, they had nine customers. By the time I left them in four years, they had 38,500. And I was very instrumental in making that happen. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, wow. Okay. And um, over your career, like over the spans about 30 years um you know given you know hindsight and retrospect we've already touched on i guess the aspect of how you would do things differently building a team but are there any other things that you might you know reflecting now have done differently from when you first started even right up until the last couple of years are there things that you would would have done differently and, and um, if so what 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 are they yeah 
Great question. Um, I would say to any listener that's thinking about doing their own business, imagine you're standing on a bowl. That bowl, you cannot fall off of it. You're the entrepreneur, you're the dreamer, you're the founder, CEO, whatever it may be. You're standing on a bowl. That bowl in its entirety is your product services. You got to keep all of those customers happy. You got to make sure that the employees around you are keeping you up on that bowl. And the ground that you're on has got to be supported by the financial investors. And then off we go on this journey. There's rocks, there's hills, there's valleys, but you can't fall off that bowl. And I think that is, to put it in visual context, is probably one of the lessons that I've learned is just to try to find the balance the balance between keeping your sanity, the balance between trying to not fall off that bowl, and to realize that all of those elements are key into the journey that you're going to go on. Yeah, that's a beautiful image. I like that. Mm. I like that. Very um, good concept. And um, we kind of touched on it a little earlier, but um, I suppose a, a, a difficulty that uh, entrepreneurs and, and business owners face is the is capital essentially like how do they get funds and yep. and you've been through that process um more than once several times in fact so um do you have any sort of advice and obviously this is you know in a general sense but any advice of how to approach that and, and what what kind of things that um you've done that you might be able to pass on other people yeah oh goodness this is a story close to my heart i've been raising capital for many many years I've probably presented to well over 500 brokers and stock investors, et cetera. It is one of the hardest things that an entrepreneur will face. Um, I guess the, the secret sauce in raising capital, and I've yet to discover all the ingredients, so I think I've got <laughs> some of it. Okay. okay. The, real, uh, the real challenge in raising capital is to keep the, to keep the messaging as concise as you possibly can. And the more technical the product or the more complex the product is, the harder it is to try to bowl that down. I'm always one to use analogies. So you're thinking about when you're presenting to the investors, taking a pot and bowling it all the way down to the thick, beautiful syrup in the bottom. You need them to be able to quickly look in the bottom of the pot and see, aha, I get it. That is a very difficult thing to do. And I think I've probably, just in clarity, I'm probably on four or 500 versions of the pitch deck. And every time you pitch, you have to polish, you have to polish. And it's an, it's an ever-evolving pitch deck. And you've got to be able to take the criticism and also then take it back, not take it to heart, but to realize that your actual messaging is wrong. Um, so you address that point and move on to the next. Yeah, okay. So actually, you know, taking the feedback and, and using it as a positive to improve. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, while you're, while you're dancing on that ball. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Good stuff. And and sort of going back, I guess, to that, um, I guess, retrospective look, Doug, um, uh, what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you over your, over your career? Look, I think the biggest challenge is uh, that first company failure. Uh, that really took the wind out of me, but I feel like um, I feel like I'm flying on the wings of an eagle because I did overcome that. I overcame the setback, and I think um, you know to be able to to be able to take that failure and turn it into a successful company. I sold to an ASX listed business. That was just like that gave me back all the strength that I'd lost in the first failure. Yeah, so keep, like just improving and and uh, restoring that confidence that you, you you initially set out at the age of twenty four with, huh? Hey? Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. And and then I guess on the on the flip side of things, what would you say is the the highlight of your career? And then is it is it that that you know that that feeling you got from uh, the sale? The sale, yeah. You know, I thought it was. I thought it was for the day I signed the paperwork and the glass of champagne we had on the day of signing. And then I remember driving down the road within a couple of days thinking, I've made it. I've, I've made a lot of money and I've, I've been successful. The dream come true tick. But within 
probably a week, I was ready looking for the next thing. So I know my story's not over yet. And I celebrated that moment in time, but I think there's many more celebrations to come. Okay, so I guess the, the, the highlight is yet to come. It is yet to come. Okay, well, let, let's talk about that then, Doug. Like, what, what is, um, what's the future of, um, well, clarity? We can start on that, but then I guess for yourself, um, I mean, when just before we started recording, you, you mentioned some exciting news. Do we want to maybe touch on that first? Yeah, I would. So Clarity's product was built for global scale. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a concept, uh, and what we're seeing now is a lot of partners in other parts of the world We've already tested it in five countries successfully. Um, we've just opened our Clarity India. So that'll be our first international expansion. Fantastic. Uh, and we've got four or five other ones lined up for the next couple of years. Uh, my view is, and I know this is a big mountaintop to get to, is I want Clarity to be worth $1 billion by 2026. Okay, wow. That's big vision, big, big goals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um and that's I guess clarity, but for yourself, Doug, um beyond that, what what do you what's the future look like for you? Yeah, I th- my kind of utopian position will be to make it to an ASX or Nasdaq listed board. I want to be a chairman, I want to be an advisor to a board. Uh I want to give back. I want to give my knowledge and expertise to upcoming entrepreneurs, uh to tech companies. Uh, to be an to be an asset to share what I've learned along the way with others. Okay, fantastic. Again, look, I know we've only really scratched the surface, but I, we we do need to transition into to the fun half of this right. conversation. So, not that we haven't been having fun. At least <laughs> I, right. I, I've been having fun anyway. But um, uh, just for our listeners, this is the part of the program where we um, discuss uh, a film of our guest choice, and that's, that's obviously you today, um, Doug. And the reason I do this is because I feel like, um, well, number one, it's part of my brand, but it's also I feel like you can learn a lot about a person from uh, the films that they like or enjoy, or even, in fact, the films they don't like, the ones that they maybe um, never want to watch again or, yeah. or kind of not like very much. But listen, the the one that we've um, selected today after talking, Doug, was um, the film um, Trainwreck. Um, so do, do you want to give a, an overview of what um, Trainwreck's about? Yeah, look, uh, it, what I like about the movie, first off, is I'm a big fan of Amy, Amy Schumer. I know she can be a little bit uh, uh, X-rated at times, <laughs> but she's a hilarious comedian, I think. Uh, she wrote the film, she and did, I yes. believe her and Bill Hader have excellent chemistry in this, and I think Bill Hader's another great actor, Uh Pretty much, he's underrated in my. I think view. he is, I, isn't I, he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, I've, to be honest, I've not seen too much of his work, but especially that film, I was like, yeah, you know, he's got, yeah. he's got something up there. But um, but I guess for those who haven't seen the film, just a, a quick rundown of of what it is. It's um, Amy Schumer plays a, uh, she's a columnist for this kind of um, what would you call it? like a sort of smutty kind of uh, magazine magazine, magazine yeah. I guess, and um. And she, you know, she doesn't particularly enjoy it, but she's living this life of, you know, partying, drinking, and she's jumping from, you know, men to men uh, every other week or every other day by the looks of things. (laughs) Um, And then she uh, gets assigned to a particular story, which is around sports, which she despises. She doesn't like sports at all, doesn't know anything about it. Um, But she's doing a piece on a uh, orthopedist, I believe, who's um, played by. Um, Bill Hader, and then and they sort of have this uh, love story that that comes together. Um, but you know, I, th- I found one of the things because I always try and find, um, I guess, some kind of message in the in the story. And one thing that really interests me, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Doug, is the that kind of element of because uh, the the film actually starts um, as a flashback because she's hearing the the, the her, her dad is going through this divorce and he's trying to explain why they're getting divorced and he's basically saying. You know, do, do you want to have the same doll every, every <laughs> and to play with the same doll, or do you want to have different dolls and you know different shapes and different sizes? And, um, and basically, he, he's something I was saying. You know, and this this is where this belief for her sets in. It's like yeah. you know, don't get married, like yeah. don't get tied down. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, and like how something so, you know, something significant in someone's life at that age can have an impact for decades like yeah. for years and years like is that do, do you feel like 
you know, are there any cases in your life that's happened or you've seen that happen as well? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. I remember as a, even a small kid, five years old, I knew technology was my thing. And um, I remember taking our home telephone apart. This is one of the phones that you used to dial yeah, with yeah. your finger. <laughs> it uh, took a little longer than, yeah. uh, you know, just a mobile phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was no Siri back then. <laughs> Um, I took that in a cassette report, recorder, took it apart, and I made a thing that you could actually record your heartbeat. Oh, wow. Okay. And yeah. I just knew that technology was just in my future. Yeah. Um, what, what age was that, by the way? Five. Five? Yeah. Jeez, a lot. It, did. it really was then. Yeah, that? my yeah. dad's like, what did you do to the phone? And uh, I ended up putting it back together, but it was just something fun to do. Um but growing up on a farm, my dad, he instilled in me and my brother hard work. You never give up. And one of his things, and my wife hates when I say this, is he would say, um, if it got too tough, he'd say, well, get in the house and put a dress on. <laughs> and I hated that. I yeah. hated that. So that was like, I've got to prove to you, Dad, that I can do this. Yeah. And I think that was one thing that he instilled in me from a very young age. Uh, work hard. Don't give up. Yeah, that's right. So like, um, yeah, like from a young age and that can carry over into years and decades and decades and decades. And, and I, I, like, I mean, personally, I think that's a good, um, uh, you know, value or an ethic to have. But then I guess in, in the case of this film, maybe not so much, you know, no. like having a, having a, um, uh, I guess, a belief that, you know, to get, you know, intimate with just a single person yeah. um, is going to hurt you and it's not, not going to yeah. work out. But um, as you've seen the film, but I guess let, let's let's dive a little into um, some of the elements that you, you sort of like about the film. Like what what what, what drew you yeah. uh, to that film? Obviously, we chose it today because um, uh, well, that, it's your choice. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> There's several funny scenes in that mm. in the film that just you know can crack you up. If you haven't seen it, I'd suggest watching it. But the one that I love probably most. And this brings it back to a situation that I remember, you know, in my first marriage, <laughs> is uh, they have an argument in one scene, and they decide to just park it. And within a few minutes, the lady brings it up again, and Amy brings it up to Bill, and she goes on and on and on. And he has a major surgery to do on a professional on athlete, athlete yeah. the yeah. next morning, <laughs> and it goes on for hours and hours, and he falls asleep. And she goes, are you asleep? And he goes, no, no, no. And she goes, yes, you were. And it just goes yeah. into this. And he, he actually falls asleep with his eyes open. <laughs> I know. That was a hilarious scene. But the next morning, he tries to do the surgery, and the professional athlete's in the bed, and he marks the wrong name. <laughs> and the athlete's already been in, um, anesthetized, uh, and he jumps up and tries to get out of the hospital. And it's just a hilarious scene. But I remember having – a very similar conversation with my ex-wife that just went on and on and on. And, uh, yeah, that's a that's a pretty funny scene. Yeah, yeah. And do you remember the first time watching the film? Like, because um, 2015, I think it came out. So, like, it's, yeah. you know, what, seven years ago now. Yeah. Um, do you remember when you first saw it? Uh, it was not too long after it came out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. um, yeah, I... I I actually can't remember when I first watched it, but I just watched it again recently when we um, when we decided we're gonna um, you know talk about it just to refresh myself. I'm like, and it's, it's it's interesting how when you watch something again and again, it changes how you see it and yeah. you know what point you are in your life as well. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it, exactly right. I mean, I can look back on it and laugh because, but you know, it it does take you back to that mental space and time where you think, oh my God, I remember a 13 hour discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the fact that, and I don't mean to offend any female listeners, but uh, ladies like to talk it through. And guys, you know, they talk it through to a point and they think we're done. And uh, you're not only done when the woman says you're done. Yeah, right. Well, I think I think that scene as well, um, I think it was... It was kind of the um, uh, Bill's fault as well because I think he was like, "Oh, my parents said you shouldn't go to sleep like uh, angry." That's so right. he starts That's it, but then right. she goes, "Okay," and then it goes on and on. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Those were some words that I think he would have regretted uh, a few hours in. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I asked you coming on because obviously there's a big sports bent to it, you know, given that he's uh, like an orthopedist for um, uh, well, for lots of different teams, but I think specifically for basketball, um, especially. Um, do, are you? We spoke a little bit about it, but are you into sports yourself, Doug? 
I love uh, college football from the States. Uh, that's probably the only sport. College football and NFL, I love to follow those two. Um, my hometown being in Knoxville, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, or they are referred to as the Volunteers. Uh, that's probably my favorite college team. Um, that stadium is just mind-blowing how big it is. Seats 120-plus thousand people. Wow. And to go there and see the crowd in their orange and white gear and the team come on the field, it's just like, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Did you play when you were younger? When I was in junior high yeah. and high school a little bit. But uh, no, I never was really the athlete. I was more the nerd wanting to figure out how to <laughs> run the sound machine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, fair enough. And you yeah. also said you're into motorsports as well, hey? Yeah, I grew up on the farm and had a motorbike age. Oh, my God. I think I had a gun and a motorbike at age five as well. A uh, little mini bike, then on to the dirt bikes. And, uh, yeah, we just had a blast growing up, jumping things and trying not to kill ourselves. Yeah. But um, so you, you don't follow any sports um, here in Australia, anything that's caught your eye or, or doesn't quite match up to um, yeah. football, huh? A lot, look, I, I'd love to say I'm an AFL uh, fan, but to me it's, a, and no offense because I think it's no, a great game. No, it's right, game. offend people, I don't it's care. A great game. <laughs> <laughs> but to me it's like hot potato. You right, know? yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's a li- I mean, it's a lot faster in the NFL in, the, uh, in America, but uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm not a huge fan. Uh, but again, I'm more of a nerd at heart than I am a, uh, a sportsman. Yeah, fair enough. I feel like rugby would be the, probably the, the the best equivalent to to football. I I, I look just because um, at the time of this recording, the Super Bowl was on like just a just a little over a week ago. Yeah, under a week ago. Monday. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It was Monday, wasn't it? Um, if it was like a sport that I could be interested in, but I just I just can't follow the rules. I um, yeah. I I need to like literally sit down and have someone tell me everything that's going on because yeah. uh, my brother's really into it he, he likes it quite a bit but um even he you know he's watched he's, he's been following it for about five years even he's there's still elements that he doesn't understand so i'm like yeah. gee you know do i need to go to like university to study so, uh, so, so football or something? i think what we need is a nice strong cup of coffee and an hour sitting down and i'll run you through it yeah and if you can teach me about cricket which is a complicated i could do game, that i could do that well i think we got another meeting I think so. <laughs> Maybe it can be one of those 13-hour ones and we'll be falling asleep and just yeah. as long as we don't, there's no surgery the next day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, well, listen, I think we uh, will bring that to a close, Doug. Um, I really want to thank you for coming along. And like I said, I feel like we only just uh, scratched the surface, so I'd love to have you along again in future. Um, but until this time, um, thanks for coming along and uh, have an excellent day. All right, Jeremy, thank you so much, and thank you to everyone listening. Thank you, Doug.